you know, if you want to study today's uh, Western television or television dramas, you have to look to the men and women who are producing those mini series in the 70s and 80s and 90s that really took an art form that wasn't being done uh, on, you know, Westerns were not being produced in great numbers anymore for film, but those same artists who were producing long series, mini series formats on television Westerns really kept the genre alive mm -hmm. and they should receive a lot of credit. And I think that when we talk about movies and uh, we really need a lot more research on the mini series or the two part Westerns that really kept the Western alive when studios were not producing. Hi, I'm Rob Word. Welcome to A Word on Westerns. I'm lucky today, and so are you, because I've got Stuart Rosebrook back to join us to talk about Westerns. Now, his dad not only wrote Junior Bonner, and the Virginian episode, but Yellow Rose with Sam Elliott and Noah Berry Jr. and Edward Albert and David Soul, some great stuff that his dad Jeb wrote. Stuart, welcome back. Thank you very much, Rob. It's great to be back with you today. Yeah, back in my right. motel room here, we're at the Western <laughs> Writers of America Association. Now, this is a great thing, the Western Writers of America. 70 years, and I think True West has been going on that's right that we've been riding for the brand along with western riders of america since 1953 you know born in that great era of uh, baby boomers and uh we still celebrate the western and the western heritage every day and uh so does the western riders of america so you know we saddle up and we keep trying to keep the west alive for the next generation well you're doing a good job of it true west is about the only magazine that i read cover to cover because every article is good and they're not really that long. They're succinct. The illustrations are fabulous coming through the inventory of stills that the magazine has. So well, thank you very much. You take a lot of pride in that. Well, it looks terrific, and I hope it continues to grow and, and turn people on to the history of the West. But you cover not only the historical facts, but for me, with uh, people like uh, Henry Park uh, talking about Western films, and that's what we're going to talk about today. Great. Yeah, we, you know, film, television, literature, preservation, and, you know, uh, a lot of these er things inspired all of us to learn more about the West, and a lot of times it was that first television show, that first Western, or maybe that first B-Western that turned people onto the West and made them a lover of the Old West. Well, the first TV Western I remember seeing, it was at my Uncle George's in Atlanta. We didn't have a TV set yet. It was the terror of Tiny Town. So <laughs> hopefully things got better, and they did in the right, 50s. Right. And a guy got turned on to all of the wonderful Western TV shows. Well, you know, we are, I was lucky to grow up in North Hollywood, and uh, Gene Autry had just about every old Western show on Channel 5 early on the morning, mm -hmm. or Channel 13, and I was an early riser. So as soon as I got up, my dad took me to the old Philco Black and White, turned it on. I think it was the Lone Ranger, Cisco Kid, Gene Autry, and Roy Rogers. Those were the first four shows that my dad would quiz me on later. Like, what's the, what's the, you know, what's Donald's horse's name? You know, uh, you know, and, and he, great. he wanted to make sure I knew all the background. And so I think it was a, t I think the Lone Ranger was probably my first favorite Western TV mm -hmm. show. With yeah. Clayton Moore, not the John oh, Hart one. Only right? Clayton Moore. <laughs> and Jay Silverheels. Yeah, Jay never left. He was uh, always there. Yeah, those were the two guys. That was, yeah. that was was He was my hero. That well, was the guy. He's still a lot of people's hero. Oh, yeah. And wonderful shows still. That's right. Even though they shot most of it on a cardboard set, it looks like. Don't pull a mask <laughs> off the old Lone Ranger. Don't do it. <laughs> oh, I know. It's great. Well, your dad, that's wonderful that he would do that to you and, and quiz you. Mine oh, yeah. would just go, go to bed. And i go, no, the credits are just starting. I want to see the credits. <laughs> and so it got to the point where my dad would say, okay, who was the director of photography? And I'd say, wow, I better read these credits. And so I started reading all the credits and was able to stay up a little bit later. Uh -huh, yeah. Know, so that was good. Yeah. Your dad wrote a wonderful Emmy-nominated movie, I Will Fight No More Forever, with Ned Romero, produced by David L. Walker. That's correct. You know, that was, um, dad started getting, a, that was a big break for him. He was doing... He had uh, written a number of screenplays, and then his mentor, Earl Hamner, had him do some episodes of The Waltons. But he soon got a reputation for being a really strong movie of the week writer. And he had done a couple of specials, um, 
uh, Miracle on 34th Street and the Princess Central Park. And then Walper hired my dad to come in. Ted Strauss had been working on a script on uh, on the Chief Joseph story. And um, I Will Fight No More Forever had huge ratings. Xerox was a big backer. Um, I think it was Hallmark Hall of Fame movie of the week, I believe. Uh, if not, it, 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 it was a remarkable moment. Um, and long before a lot of casting was looking at diversity, I Will Fight Fight No More Forever had one of the largest um, indigenous American Indian um, acting crews ever hired. Crews, filmed, not just on camera. Crews. Yeah, crews. And, and they filmed it down in Mexico. Most people don't know that. A lot of that, then, but the, the, the cast um, was really a dramatic breakthrough. And, you know, Roots followed I Will Fight No More Forever. And I think, you know, a dad was nominated for an Emmy, um, as was Ted Strauss. He got, was lauded by critics, but one of the greatest, um, uh, things to look back on is, is that today, when you go to the Nez Perce National Historical Park at the Big Hole Battlefield, I will find no more forever is sold at that park. Literally. It really has stood up and uh, nobody has duplicated the drama and the poignancy of that message since that movie. That's uh, really a, uh, it was a really, and he got a lot of work after that on docudramas. Part of his, Romero, what heritage you see? I think it's um, both uh, um, American Indian and possibly Hispanic, but uh, he um, he was good. And James Whitmore too. And Sam what, Elliott. What a story that is. And Sam Elliott in a very early uh, television mm -hmm. role, mm -hmm. a very strong role for him. It was a very strong cast. Now you didn't go to Mexico. Well, no, 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 no. We, but uh, it was um, we did go downtown to 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 be extras on Miracle on Thirty Fourth Street. Mm -hmm. That's another story. <laughs> We filmed that, and that was filmed in the summer in downtown, and you know, in uh, in Los Angeles, everybody had to get their Christmas clothes on as extras. To who played Santa in that one? Uh, that was Sebastian Cabot. Mm -hmm. In my role, you got to look for it. I was I had a uh, builder cook was close to my dad, and my sister was supposed to have a, a speaking role. She was going to get you know a speaking role. I and uh, she got too nervous, and then I was given the role of shooting Santa in the face with a squirt gun, <laughs> and. Uh, you have to look hard to find it. I think it's been edited out. But Sebastian Cabot, as Chris Kringle, turns to me and says, little boy, what would you like for Christmas? And I went one, two, three, down on a knee and right in the face with a squirt gun. And, and you uh, got him. I got him. Two takes. <laughs> and, uh, and so that was my big uh, moment. I, I sometimes think, oh, my goodness, you know. My, where was my agent? Shooting Santa Claus in the face of squirt gun? I never got another role. A lot of publicity. <laughs> you and Bruce Stern, you know, it's like those people, you know, no. Duke shot Duke and you shot Santa. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> there goes that career. But look at what Bruce has done since then. Right. What a wonderful, strong actor. You need a second chance. <laughs> yes. <laughs> You've been practicing with your squirt gun? Sure. Oh, yeah. Okay. Well, let's get back to Sam Elliott. You know, uh -huh. The uh, David Walper. I will fight no more forever. Right. That had been a bestseller. That's right. Sam, one of his early parts, and he's so identified with westerns. Too. Right. Have you met Sam? I never have. Hmm. You know, um, love to. I know that I had just gone to college when they started doing the Yellow Rose mm -hmm. over at Warner Brothers with mm -hmm. John Wilder. And so Joe. you were never at any of those. No, Joe Byrne was my dad's partner, and they uh, were the line, you know, the producers and uh, writers of uh, in, of Yellow Rose. Well, and, let's talk a little bit about that because unlike Yellowstone, there was not a murder every week in Marion no. in the backyard. It was a modern day western with Sam and a terrific cast supporting him, Sybil Shepherd. Sybil Shepherd, her big comeback role. You know, she does moonlighting after the Yellow Rose, mm -hmm. and. Um, I have to go back, but I believe I remember Yellow Rose was put on Friday night. And, you know, and uh, David Soul, um, it was his big role after Starsky and Hodge. Mm -hmm. And so it had a big cast, a lot of promotion, a lot of promotion, filmed over at Warner Brothers. Um, and, you know, it's just sometimes a matter of timing in terms of what does the studio want? What does the network want in terms of edge? You know, mm -hmm. were they going to allow the Yellow Rose to become as edgy as Dallas mm -hmm. or, you know, in like Falcon Crest or Earl Hammer's doing the Falcon it Crest. It followed Dallas. So Dallas uh -huh. had already been on and Correct. was a big hit. That's yeah. why Yellow Rose got a green light. That's right. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, it was the modern West and a dot, you know, and a melodrama and, um, 
you know, it's, uh, it already knows television business is tough. And, you know, the right night sometimes is the most important thing. Well, back then, especially when there's only three networks. That's right. Going they on. were fighting, I think, for Wednesday or Thursday night. And they got the Friday night at 10 o'clock. Mm -hmm. And that's a, that's a, can be a tough, tough slot. It's worked for Tom Selleck in Blue Blood. Yeah. Well, yeah. that's been such a hit and a right. surprise, too, for a Friday night. But I think a lot of that has been... An older demographic stays home on Fridays, and the young people who aren't, well, they're not watching network right. TV anymore anyway. Right. So, but it was uh, my dad uh, and Joe were you know, Warner Brothers, and Yellow Rose was, was a big show. And Joe and John Wilder were very good friends mm -hmm. since uh, they were young men, and so they had a great time working on that series. Well, John Wilder, he had been an actor yes. before. Uh -huh. What kind of a guy is he? He is a tremendous man. He knows. He's had an incredible career in Hollywood as a writer and producer. He did Centennial. That's too. right. And Centennial should be considered one of the greatest Western miniseries of all time. It's right up there with Lonesome. To me, there is not Lonesome Dove without John Wilder Centennial. Mm -hmm. It really, he broke the ground. It's right there with Roots at that time period in terms of an art form of the miniseries. And it was a huge success, too. Huge though. success. And Robert Conrad was never better. Never better than right. that. And Barbara Carrera? Right. It never looked better. Right. She was pretty hot. Yeah, most yeah. definitely. And, you know, if you want to study today's uh, Western television or television drama, streaming, et cetera, or short series, um, you have to look to the men and women who are producing those mini series in the 70s and 80s and 90s that really took an art form that wasn't being done. Uh, on, you know, Westerns were not being produced in great numbers anymore for film, but those same artists who were producing long series, mini series formats on television westerns really kept the genre alive. Mm -hmm. And they should receive a lot of credit. And I think that when we talk about movies, uh, we really need a lot more research on the mini series or the two part westerns that really kept the western alive mm -hmm. when studios were not producing. You were involved with that. Well, uh, I was lucky. I was lucky. I was at Quintex when we merged with uh, Robert Halmy and uh, Suzanne DePass and did Lonesome Dove, which was, to me, the greatest miniseries, western miniseries ever. And it's one of those that is so perfectly cast, so well-directed, Everything about it works. The score, you hear that music and you get chills. Yeah. It, uh, it's wonderful. And, I, and everybody wanted it to be in it. I remember when it was being developed, I was having lunch with Ben Johnson and Dick Farnsworth, and they're going, isn't that a role for me? And I'm like, oh, you guys are just a little too old now for this right? magic happen. No. And it was magic, and it's, it still is. But the Sackets is another wonderful one. Most definitely. That uh, Bob Totten directed, uh, Doug Netter produced it, and when that came out, there weren't any Westerns. I believe that was 1979, and it was a, a two-parter originally, from what I understand. Right. It ran even longer, and so there's about an hour that was never used uh -huh. that could have made it even longer, but it's so well done. The, the costumes, the performances, that is the role that it put Tom Selleck on the map to get Magnum P.I. Right. That's right. And uh, and later on, Quigley Down Under. Mm -hmm. Now, didn't they also do, what was the other, the Sackets? There was they a, did the Shadow Riders. That right. was a follow-up, which right. not nearly as good. And they were hoping to make it a sequel, but mm -hmm. the, the rights somehow made that impossible. They didn't have quite the, the right script, I mm -hmm. guess. The first one... And I think Jim Burns wrote the first one right. and was one of the producers. It just, that really holds up. And I loved all those big hats that everybody right. wore, too, and the, the, the wardrobe. And Buck Taylor is fantastic in that, right. too. Most definitely. Now, wasn't How the West Was Won redone about that time period? Too? How the West Was Won was a little bit before. It was okay. the McKay hands mm -hmm. that got such big ratings that it became the How the West Was Won. I believe that was 1977. How did he become interested in in writing westerns well he had a, a different childhood than most people he was born in new york his father was an advertising agent and my grandmother worked for king syndicate but he was diagnosed with asthma and at nine years old my grandparents sent him to the warm ranch school in rural arizona it was 90 miles on a dirt road from phoenix and he was raised at boarding schools for the rest of his childhood, from fourth grade through twelfth grade. And other than a year and a half in Florida, 
he lived at this orm at the orm ranch and then their family farm in virginia so he had this urban rural life mm -hmm. and i think he i've always joked and i thought to my that myself that he his parents were creative but he was a little bit like the kid from captain courageous you know he was sent out and had to adapt a whole mm -hmm. different world and so a lot of his love of the West came from the fact that he lived in a, uh, in, in all the kids at this rural boarding school had to work the ranch. And so every, they had to work Roundup and the dairy cows and the, and the chickens and the pigs. And so his love of the West came from the fact that this little New York kid grew up on a working ranch in central Arizona. Didn't he miss his mom and dad though out there? Oh yeah. Most definitely. And the, the Orm family, Charlie, Mimi Orm and his parents, Uncle Chicken, Aunt Mano, promised to raise children just like they raised their own. Mm -hmm. And there was actually a couple of times that he didn't go home for Christmas. Mm -hmm. the, the the legend is the trains were filled with troops. Mm -hmm. And so he stayed for Christmas. And then he'd go to Los Angeles. His first introduction to LA was he had an a, an actress aunt, um, uh, Aunt Florence, and he would go stay with her. And so very early on, he started writing in um, junior high and high school. Mm -hmm. And I think um, it was in his, it was in his blood. Well, Aunt Florence, what was her last name? Did, did you ever uh, see yeah, her in film? You know, Aunt Florence was an actress in on Ziegfeld Follies. Mm -hmm. And she was, um, it, there was more than one Florence darling. Florence Fallon was her maiden name. And she was actually involved in a pretty big scandal. Um, and, and she married a producer um, uh, named Rosenquist. And then, and I, I don't have direct knowledge of this, but it's kind of the 42nd story. Uh, she was then swept off her feet by a New Mexico rancher named Hopewell. Her name was Florence Hopewell. And big scandal in uh, on Broadway in the 1920s. And off she went, the Irish girl from the Bronx to New Mexico and California, Florence Hopewell. And she, her uh, niece, um, uh, Nancy Hopewell, Nancy Cherney, she actually was a longtime actress and extra in Hollywood. And so there was this, and my, my grandmother herself, dance with George White scandals. Oh, wow. So there was a little entertainment bug mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. EMA in the family. Well, and, uh, he, it's it's great that he followed that and and wonderful that Earl Hamner gave him these tips on on how to succeed because obviously he did. What's your first memory of your dad writing was he going, "I can't concentrate with you kids in here, get out." Well, you know, it was interesting. He um had uh, a Earl Hamner was a, a friend, uh, and the, he knew the Hamners from Virginia because he had grown up there in the in the summer times. He'd spent his he lived in rural Virginia as well. And um, Earl, he contacted Earl when he had moved out there, and he was working in advertising in downtown. And one of Earl's advices advice to my father was get yourself an office. Um, Earl had children just a little older than my sister and I, Scott and Carrie, and he said, you know what, Jeb, if you're going to be successful, you need an office. So as soon as he started pursuing his career. He uh, got this office down on Ventura Boulevard and uh, later on became the Whit Thomas building that was down there. Um, and dad went to work six days a week and he always carried his uh, typewriter back and forth. He had a portable at Royal and he went to work and came home every day with that typewriter. So one of my earliest memories is my father leaving the house with his briefcase in one hand and his typewriter in the other. And that was his, he would never leave it at his office. Well, I never heard that about a writer needing an office. How does that make sense? A writer, it's, it's a singular work. All you need is quiet, usually. Yeah, and that was it, separating family from work. And so that when he came home, he was there with my mom and, uh, and my, my sister and I, and he wasn't one of the writers who would go out to the outside, let's say, converted garage room and write well into the night. He, his job, he decided he was going to be, was 10 hours or 12 hours. He went to the office and he worked every Saturday, half a day. And so he's very disciplined. And I think that that would lead to his success in trying to beat the odds to become a, a professional screenwriter was to have that office. And I think when he first started, he didn't even have a phone, you know, but he got himself an agent. And he followed this philosophy from that he learned in college was write at least one story a week and submit that story for publication or for production.